I have the pleasure to present to you Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Oh, oh, freedom. I have a dream. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. But one day, this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream. I know you're asking today, how long will it take? How long, not long, we are not about to turn around. Yes, sir. We're on the move now. Yes, sir. Yes, we're on the move, and no wave of racism can stop us. Yes, sir. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now, because I've been to the mountaintop, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Daniel Burston, and I'm a professor of psychology at Duquesne University. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Duquesne University Social Justice Association, the McAnulty College of Liberal Arts, the Elsinore Benu Think Tank for Restorative Justice, the Shriver Initiative for Equity in Education, the Cyril Wecht Institute, Institute for Forensic Science, and last but not least, the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, uh, which has graciously provided the technical and logistical support for today's event. Uh, as you know, uh, today is Martin Luther King Day, and to mark this occasion, we're gathering to discuss our current crisis and the ways in which we can defend and improve our fragile democracy in the face of threats from domestic terrorists and insurgents who wish to deepen our divisions. And in the case of the Boogaloo Boys, for example, start a new civil war. Indeed, the groups and organizations that stormed the Capitol on January 6th represent the very antithesis of everything that Dr. King stood for. Dr. King believed that a loving heart and a truth-loving disposition tend to go hand in hand, that hatred only flourishes in the midst of lies. And we have been subjected to a ceaseless torrent of lies for the last four years, most recently from our own president who claims with no evidence that the recent election was stolen through massive fraud. The fact that millions of Americans who still support Donald Trump and prefer it to the truth is a fact that we will have to reckon with as a country for many years to come. Our panelists today include Dr. N uh, Professor Norman Conti of Duquesne University's uh, Sociology Department, uh, Mr. Uh, Tyley Thompson and uh, Mr. Tom Farrell, who are longstanding members of the Elsinore Bennu Think Tank for Restorative Justice. They will introduce themselves and uh, tell you more about their work as our seminar unfolds. But I've asked, in the meantime, for the benefit of the audience, I want you to know that I've asked our panelists to reflect on the following questions or clusters of questions for the benefit of uh, today's discussion. First, what are the main social, political, and economic forces that contributed to the insurrection on Capitol Hill? And why did the rioters succeed in gaining entry to the Capitol, menacing the lives of lawmakers, including, but not limited, obviously not limited to our vice president, despite early warnings of imminent violence from the FBI and other sources. Second, what are the repercussions uh, uh, of these events uh, and those that will unfold in the days and weeks ahead? What, are the re what, reper what repercussions are these events likely to have on the Biden presidency and on, and on our nationwide calls for police reform? Third, and finally, what steps can we as ordinary citizens take to diminish the dangers of disinformation and domestic terrorism going forward? What steps should President Biden, his cabinet, Congress, ensure that something like this doesn't happen again and hold those responsible accountable for their misdeeds? Our panelists will speak for roughly, roughly 15 minutes each, after which they will respond to one another's
Norm. Thank you, Dan. Um, I'm sorry to have to be here today uh, on this topic, but here we are. And I'm happy to be on a panel with my very good friends of mine, all of them. Uh, my name is Norman Conti. I'm a sociologist at Duquesne University. I had the privilege uh, to spend my youth in school uh, studying policing and the way people go from being ordinary citizens to becoming more like what we think of as police. That socialization process uh, has been the first 20 years of my career focusing on that. Along the way, I got involved with a program that takes college students into prison to take courses with the men and women incarcerated in those facilities. At some point, I had the idea to put uh, both of those both of those ideas together, police socialization and this inside out program. And hopefully that'll be the thing I can get to for question number three. But for question number one, as a sociologist who devote so much time and thought to issues of crime and justice. Uh, the, the short minute and a half video we saw at the beginning of the presentation was created by the Lincoln Project. That's a bunch of former Republican strategists and operatives and um, media makers who have come out post Trump and maybe even as Trump was coming to power and voice their regret, right? Voice their regret about slicing up, working so hard to slice up the American population. If you listen, if you listen to the founders talk, they, they explained that it's really about thin slices. You know, you have to divide the country up into very thin slices in order to try to get your messages out and win the election. They understand that there's for Republicans or Democrats, there are certain states that are unwinnable, right? They understand that it's only about a few small groups. And it's not, it's the, the idea of e pluribus unum of many one is bad for people that want to be in power, right? You want e pluribus pluribus of many, many, right? Or many more, right? So when I look at January 6th, I think of the criminal justice system or I'm focused on the criminal justice system. We live in a nation where the purpose of our criminal justice system has been to get the majority of the population looking at the poor, being afraid of the poor, seeing the poor as a threat and a source of harm rather than looking at where the greater harms come from and the greater harms tend to come from the people with more power, right? So our criminal justice system is really a a con it's a misdirection to get everyone looking down down the social pyramid instead of up right and it it's so insidious that it it tricks so many of us in so many different ways that even when we want to resist it right even when we're trying to you know correct the oppressors or stand up or whatever we're misdirected to focus on policing right because police are the most dynamic, the most immediate representation of the government. So if our criminal justice system is oppressing, is treating unfairly minorities, people of color, then let's start with the first people that are doing that. So this, th this pyramid system is so effective that not only does it get everyone looking down for the threat, when we, when we try to change that, we just look sideways right? Because the police are working class people. And then you get these other pe the people that showed up in Washington who are supposed to be, claimed to be supportive of the police, right? Who are most likely not supportive of minorities, don't see this uh, system as oppressive, right? They're the ones fighting with the police, even though they're saying they support the police. There's this, that image of the two groups, right? You have this group of police officers who are heroically trying to protect human life, right? Standing against a crowd of thousands. So it's like, here you have these police officers who we see as a source of power, they represent power to us. And here we have these other people who 
things aren't working out for them. So they need to believe in this lie, right? They need to believe in these ideas that explain why things aren't working out for them. So these two groups are fighting. And it, it, it disturbs me to no end because I have the great fortune to work uh, with men who have been incarcerated, women who have been incarcerated. I have the great fortune teaching the police academy as I have been for the past four or five years has been one of the great honors of my life. Uh, and I see police officers having to run from crowds, having to mislead crowds in different directions, having to be squished in doors, suffering. And it's horrifying to me. So for the first question, uh, this has all been a misdirection, right? So many of our social institutions, social, political, and economic factors, right? All of them, all of them are designed to get us looking in the wrong direction. What are the uh, repercussions? Um, what are the effects on policing and protests? Again, Police have an incredibly difficult job in a democracy. In a democracy, we ask police to keep us safe, don't cost too much money, follow the constitution, and by the way, don't be racist even though you're the product of a racist society, right? That's impossible. And then we get frustrated and we protest. What steps can ordinary citizens take to address, contain, and hopefully eliminate the dangers posed by domestic terrorism? What should the president, Congress, and major corporations, what steps should they take to strengthen American democracy in the face of growing threats to the safety and the stability of the Republic? On Friday of last week, I had a uh, class meeting. It was on Zoom and it was, 20 or 30 police recruits and 15 or 20 men and women who had been incarcerated. And it's, it's, it's the program's called Police Training Inside Out. Leading into that, the sergeant told me, she said, Norm, the recruits, they're feeling emotionally unwell because of all the focus on race and racism in, in the first two meetings of this course. And that was horrifying to me because so often when people try diversity trainings or anti-racism training or sexual harassment training, I've seen it make things worse, right? I've seen it make people more entrenched in their values. So it's like, oh my God, what if, what if this work I'm trying to do is making things worse? So I had to figure out a way. And fortunately I had, I had help from my great, my great friends, the wise uh, elders, who have done decades in prison for no reason. Um, I had them to support me and we could kind of gently walk these recruits through this and explain they're very, they're very young and I don't know that they understood going into this, the difference between structural racism and individual racism and they sort of felt like, I don't hate black people. I don't hate minorities. I don't wanna do harm to these groups. So when we talk about the racism of the system, right? They take it personally and they feel guilty and they feel terrible. And what do we do? How do we, how do we move forward with that? So we had this course, I think it went pretty well by the end. Uh, I think we got that idea across to the uh, to the recruits, and I hadn't slept the night before because I was so so concerned about how I was going to manage this. And then I I walked out of this room into my kitchen, and my wife hugged me. And some of you know my my father passed away just a month ago, and he was uh, to put it as as kindly and respect. He was not an easy person to deal with, right, and. My wife said, you know, Norm, your father was with you as, you as you ran that session because through him, you learned this way of fighting where you can't, you can't lose because he won't respect you, 
but you could never win because he won't forgive you, right? And being able to do that balancing act uh, with them, that, that thing I learned from my father, uh, or had to learn because of my father, is, is what allows me to do this work, right? And then I started thinking about my mother, and uh, my mother is 82, and she's so fun and great and uh, full of love and uh, optimism. But, and she has radios, old fashioned radio, not old fashioned, but radios, what, what we would call radios, the kids would consider that an old fashioned, a radio in every other room in her house that plays Rush Limbaugh or whatever the radio equivalent or what those things are. And then she watches Fox News for three hours at night, every night. And there was a point, uh, there was a point where I was doing these federal trainings on implicit, implicit bias, this very vanilla idea that we all have race, racism internalized in, in us and how to, just to see it. And there was a point where Donald Trump made that illegal, right? He banned the teaching of that. I am someone who operates from a critical race theory perspective and Donald Trump would not allow that word to be spoken right? And my mother voted for him. You see, and I, and I explained that before she voted. So I'm not exactly sure. I think there has to be a balancing. This is starting getting to what do we do? There has to be this balance between self and society, the personal and political, where we understand that our parents, all of our parents, and it could be the founding fathers and whoever, however you want to look at this in democracy, everyone's parents give them, even the worst parents, give you the materials to build a good life with, right? So our parents give us the materials to build a good life with. Our founding fathers have given us the material to build a good country with, or good democracy with. At the same time, we have to open our eyes. We have to try to look at the big picture. I don't think that, I don't know that Biden or any Democrat or any Republican has a real interest in that. I would, I'd like to hope so. But we have to look at the people on all sides, whether it is, for me, it's easy because I've got cops who I love and I've got these folks who've been in prison, who are prison, who are never going to get out of prison who I love so deeply, like I love my father and my mother, and try to figure out how all of this can work together and how we can fight against those, those madmen, those admen who are trying to sell us the division and really the disillusion of whatever democracy is. So that's, that's, just, that's your homework uh, since I'm a professor. Go out. It's Monday, you have till Friday, uh, get that done and, and I'll be here when you need me. Thank you very much. Ty Lee. Yes, so <laughs> uh, I'm Ty Lee Thompson. First of all, uh, you know, I'm honored uh, to be here speaking amongst um, such uh, amazing uh, group of panelists. Uh, I'm, I'm honored that that folks felt like I had a perspective that could bring value to this conversation. Um, I mean, I'm someone who 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 has a wide uh, range of experiences um, that kind of you know um, develops this perspective uh, that I have. Um, I'm, I'm a returning citizen, so I'm someone who uh, has done time in the criminal justice system. Um, I have several degrees. I have a, a, a associate's degree as a paralegal, a bachelor's degree in legal studies. Um, I'm currently a director of violence prevention for uh, Operation Better Block. Um, uh, Aaron Dalton tells me that I can, I can consider myself a specialist in the disease model of, uh, of this public health approach to uh, gun violence um, with understanding that violence is a disease um, and it works like any other contagious disease. Um, so with that being said, um, connecting that to the current subject matter, um, there's a couple couple directions that I thought about taking this, uh, you know, as I as I was preparing, you know, my thoughts, and uh, it's 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 just so many different things. Like first of all, I was like to say, 
that um, as someone who was on the inside of the criminal justice system, we always um, felt like if, if, if everybody could understand that the woman is supposed to have a blindfold on, uh, that in, in, in the scales of justice, and, and when, you, when it leans one way, then you're consequenced for whatever your action was, and it leans the other way, then you're not consequenced, but she's supposed to have a blindfold on. And, um, and a lot of times we felt like, you know, you know, we assumed that, you know, everybody understood and worked under that. And when you see uh, what happened um, uh, on, on the 6th uh, at, at the, at, you know, at the Capitol in, in DC, um, at the Capitol building, you start to realize that, well, I've always realized it, you know, over the years, but you realize that she doesn't have a blindfold on. She, she takes it off when she realized that it's her own people coming um, uh, from a certain culture uh, that has become the identity of America. And she kind of rips the blindfold off. And then all of a sudden, law enforcement didn't feel threatened, even though they were being beaten with fire extinguishers. Um, and folks were beating them with hammers and they were beating them with, with anything they can get their hands on all of a sudden law enforcement didn't feel threatened to shoot them. Like the, the way that we've seen, um, you know, black kids um, and women um, be shooting, be shot dead in the streets when folks felt that their lives were threatened. And it was clearly, it was a clear situation. I mean, on, on film, on camera, every, every channel, every iPhone that was there recording that law enforcement's life was, was, was being threatened. I mean, unfortunately, you know, some folks that four or five folks died um but you under we we understand and i say we also me as, as a returning citizen as african-american realized that if that was a group of us storming <laughs> the the capital um if it was even 50 percent of us in that group storming the capital a lot of people would have felt like their lives would have been in danger and we'd have been gunned down on the steps. I mean, it would have been body bags all over the place. But um, so for for the world to see that you can have law enforcement, and 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 I'm I'm for law enforcement. Um, actually, um, my wife is a, is a police officer, so I'm all for you know law enforcement. But you've seen that law enforcement had the ability to show restraint in this particular matter for whatever reason. But with but what the thing is, is what got us here with Donald Trump and what got us here with what took place um, in D.C. at the Capitol was an old playbook. This was a playbook from the 1800s. Like, if you study Reconstruction, you will see the playbook that they actually went to to, 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 to drum up this support to be able to get Donald Trump in there, to drum up this support, to have this this anger towards let's say at the time as democrats um before you know this roles were switched you know Demo you know the party of lincoln was the ones that actually freed the slaves you know so you you see the, the actual playbook when you think about the fact when i say reconstruction like we, it, it all started it starts and end with reconstruction when lincoln was given the, the speech on reconstruction on how this, this country needed to be reconstructed so that they involve um, slaves, former slaves, in this whole America, um, and that they felt like they owed former slaves something to, be, to reconstruct this country because of the role that, that we played in Civil War and actually saving this union. Um, but it was that speech that, that John Wilkes Booth said, that was the last speech that, that Lincoln would ever give. And two weeks later, he made, up, you know, made good on that promise when he killed Lincoln. So it was always the thing of reconstruction that got us to the point that we were, we were stuck in a sense, like reconstruction ended, like it never, the promise of reconstruction, reconstructing this country to involve us as citizens in it is when, you know, a man says that's the last speech he'll give because he will have no parts of that. And there's a whole group of folks um, that believe in that same, that same theory, that same motto. Um, when you think about the daughters of the Confederate who feels like they were done wrong, they have, they have, they've been in justice because um, the North won the war and, and, and they felt like their property was taken away from, their, from them, which was slaves, which was my ancestors, um, and therefore they lost their wealth. 
there's 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 hundred there's ten twenty no what what was it the last number that I seen it was thirty thousand forty thousand of women called daughters of the Confederate that felt like you know that they they are done wrong that that wealth was was removed from them because you freed my ancestors because that was their property, that was their wealth. They didn't get a chance to become Southern bells now because they no longer could en enslave my ancestors. Um, and, they, and, and so when you have those things that, that happen um, and it allowed them to actually, let's say, paint the narrative and continue to build monuments of, of, uh, of, of slover, Southern um, soldiers, and have this 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 voice in a sense because then they went all over the country actually putting up monuments. Um, so what happened on at, at, in, in in D.C. On, in January on the sixth, it wasn't this wasn't like a surprise. This was like that's why you seen the Confederate flag flag in the Capitol building. Like this is a playbook. They they went to this playbook. They went to this playbook when they knew that they had a candidate like Trump from the door that refused to acknowledge um, President Obama as an as a American citizen, as a, as a legitimate presidency. So they said, okay, we got the right person now. We got the, we, we got the right, you know, we always had that underlining um, folks that would agree with this and allow us to continue, first of all, stopping the reconstruction process and pushing this narrative of what continues to need that to happen or, or the unjust that they felt was done to them um, with the Civil War, so to me, what needs that what needs to happen is is we have to to reexamine Reconstruction, look at where it stopped, because during Reconstruction times, you know, I, I was just before I um, prepared myself for for this presentation, I was looking at there was a, a poster during the Reconstruction era, and it was about the Freedmen Bureau, and the Freedmen Bureau it had a, a sentence that says. It said, if you support Congress's work um, for this Freedman Borough, then you support the Negro. But if you sustain something about the president's work, then you support the white man. And literally, there has always been an underlining um, theme in America that we will, we will have due process, we will have these processes in place, and the minute that they don't work, then we'll turn to violence. Literally, we will turn to violence and then we'll get what we need. So during this, this period of Reconstruction, there was a, a presidency where they claimed fraud. They claimed that there was going to be violence. They claimed that it was going to be haze or violence or blood in the streets. And at that point, America and the government said, OK, listen, listen, we, we'll compromise here. You, we got to let this election results be what they are. But what we, what we will do for you is we'll let you do what you want with your Negroes. And, and at that time, it, it, America actually left us hanging as a, as a race. They, they actually, at that point, they actually removed, ripped through the troops from down south, and they told the southern states, listen, you can do what you want with your Negroes, but this threat of violence and, and, and where you're at with it, you know, they felt like when, when you, if you look at the documentary that uh, Louis Gates puts together, he says that they felt it, it was too much money to actually continue to protect the, the, the Negroes in the southern states, so therefore they had to withdraw the troops. And at that point, you know, they, they left us hanging as, as, as a race, as a culture, and the promise that they made of reconstruct, reconstruction of this country and involving us in that process. And then there was some things along the way that went along with that, with that as far as the 14th Amendment. Um, and, and it's just been time and time. So to, to, to answer some of the questions really quickly is it's an old playbook that gets you to what you get on January. Um, what can we do? Um, we can get back to re, um, revisiting Reconstruction. We actually should get back to having some Freedmen boroughs all, through over the, all throughout the country that protects the rights of African Americans when it comes to uh, business and, and ownership of land and, um, and just our, our constitutional rights, like to be honest. Um, but the thing is, is, is that um, we, and we definitely need to um, tell the history of the Civil War and tell the history, speak the history of the Reconstruction, speak to the history of the violence that America has always turned to when things weren't quite working the way that they, that they wanted them to work. And, and to me, that's, that's like the, the biggest, 
Um, like, uh, I, I think there was a word that Norm used, he, he called it a, a fraud. You see, it was something similar to a fraud or it, it's the biggest, because I always thought, I'm to being honest, always thought that the justice system was set up that when I do bad, they're going to punish me and that's going to be my consequence. But whoever does bad will be punished and that will be consequences and this would be all across the board. And the more you become a part of the system and, 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 and then when you come out of the system and you say, okay, as long as I don't do X, Y, Z, then, you know, I won't become a, a, a product or harmed by that system. But it, it's really, it's not set up to really um, punish people for doing bad things. It, it's, it's set up to continue to support um, free, free labor, um, slavery, that, that whole institution of slavery. Um, I look at the fact that right now I have a, I have a, a felony conviction on my record and for for drug possession and and the drug possession was marijuana but over 30 grams it turns into a, a felony with the intent to deliver now that's at the objection of the officer that says he had the intent to deliver um which gives me the felony and then as i as i leave my home every morning and i see these long lines of, of people lined up to buy marijuana and and right now it's medical marijuana uh, eventually it'll, it'll be legalized marijuana and folks will have businesses and there'll be great business, you know, for people. And I'll still have this felony on my record that will hinder me at, at different times, you know, from, you know, being looked at as, as a, as a normal citizen, uh, in society. And, and it's just, it's just amazing. So what I can say is that what we all need to do outside of, you know, re-examine and reconstruction, um, is just holding each other accountable. Like when Norm said he had a conversation with his mother, you know, on what it was she was supporting. Like we gotta hold each other accountable and, and be clear with the language and be, be direct. And if they don't understand, sit them down and have them watch a documentary. Like if you watch some of this, this stuff and you know the history, you'll be blown away. Like, wow, that really happened? Like there was mobs of, of white people that went into towns that was, had black mayors in the 1800s and just literally murdered everyone that they, that, they could, that they could see down in Charleston. I think it was in North Carolina. Um, and then it happened in New Orleans uh, where 40 were killed. And then it happened in the riots in Memphis where 48 folks were killed and only two were white. Um, that violence was always the way of America when things weren't working, how they felt it should work under due process or under these systems that they, that they ended up setting up. And, and then what I understand that now is when I look at the work that I do with trying to address violence in, in, in our communities um, and understanding that it's a disease, I realized that we were originally affected by this disease um, from white mobs. Like when gangs were, were originally um, forming, it was to prevent white mobs from coming into our community and committing the violence that they were known to commit. And then once you remove that, that threat of white mobs no longer coming in, now you get to the point um, that you've been affected by this disease of violence and then the spread happens within the community and then you end up having black on black crime and, and the violence that'll have, that takes place within these communities. That's why when it comes to addressing the violence um, within our community, I, I feel that white folks should be at the table for sure um, because it would be like, it would be like technically, I, I don't, you know, they say that, that Corona came from the COVID came from uh, China. It would be like China saying, you know, we don't want to have anything to do with that disease that you guys are dealing with, um, even though it may have originated in our location. So when it comes to addressing violence in our communities, you know, I, I feel that whites and blacks should always be working on that issue together um, because it's not something that we infected um, with, our, you know, on ourselves. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm, I'm troubled. I'm, I'm, I'm scared. Because, you know, when they show you what they will do, um, what they have done to police officers, um, and they were talking about hanging white people in the Capitol. Um, and once that, that target is taken, you know, we're no longer, that's their target. To me, it always ends up reverting back um, to where the violence was originally targeted, which would become black people. So, you know, if they protect, they got 20,000 troops protecting the Capitol, and they'll have all these troops protecting Capitals all over the country. But then who protects us once again when it gets to the point that they feel like, okay, all the, all the, the enforcement is stopping us from committing the violence where we want to commit it at. And, and then now you get back to what you had in the 1800s where they were just roaming 
communities looking for black folks to commit violence on. So I'm scared right now, to be honest. And then I'm also, you know, scared with the work that my wife does as a, as a police officer as well. So I, I, I you know, moving forward, um, it's, it's a challenging um, time in this country. Um, uh, I'm someone that has been affected by, you know, white violence um, before I was born. My grandmother was murdered October 9th, 1965 on the North Side by a white woman, shot her in the head. Felt like they should not have been able to live in that community on, at the time down on Ridge Avenue. And, you know, they kind of had arguments for weeks. And then while the, once the woman was out on bond for shooting at my uncle, she ended up um, getting into a dispute with my grandmother. Um, and then she eventually shot my grandmother in the head and in the chest because she felt like, as the articles put it, that the renters should not live in their neighborhood, which was, the, you know, my grandmother's a black family. Um, dealing with a, with a white woman. And the thing is, is, is the woman was convicted of murder and a judge suspended her sentence and she received one year probation. One year probation after being convicted of murder, of murdering my grandmother in October 9th, 1965. So um, all of that, so, so as, as this violence is happening, you know, it, it creates so much, so, so many thoughts and feelings inside of me um, and, I, and I'll probably um, do a really great job of uh, suppressing them. But um, with stuff like this is happening, that, that fear, because, you know, trauma can be generational. So just imagining, you know, the trauma, you know, of, of my mother at the time, 11, 12 years old, when her mother was murdered on the north side because of racial tension. They call it interracial housing issues. And I looked at uh, some of the paperwork from my, my mother's, my grandmother's corpse, um, court case and, 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 and realized how they, how they um, identified her as house, as a house worker or, and I'm saying to myself, why, why is that important? Like, why was her occupancy at the time important? And they called her a house worker. It was something with, you know, that she must have cleaned somebody's house. And they had that on the paperwork that actually said this woman was convicted of murder, but received a suspended sentence and one year probation. So with, with that being said, I'm a, I'm a, um, passing along to uh, my good friend, Tom Farrell. Thanks, Ty Lee. Um, uh, Ty Lee and I are, and Norm are, are uh, participants and members of the, the Elsinore Bennu think tank. I'm also a lawyer and uh, spent about 35 years practicing law, mainly in the criminal justice system as a federal prosecutor and a criminal defense lawyer. Um, I, but but in answering these questions, uh, uh, I think the place to start uh, first is the day before January 6th of this year, but January 5th, and in a different place, Kenosha, Wisconsin. Because January 5th was the day that the district attorney in Kenosha was going to announce whether or not he'd bring charges against the police officer who shot Jacob Blake six times in the back in front of his three young sons and left him paralyzed from the waist down. The decision, as we know now, was not to bring charges against the, the police officer in preparation for that announcement. The authorities in Kenosha ringed the courthouse with concrete barriers. On top, the concrete barriers were 10 foot steel fences and in front of the courthouse were 500 armed National Guardsmen armed with automatic weapons. We didn't see any of that January 6th in Washington, D.C. Jacob Blake is black, and the protesters who showed up later in the day were all black. I think that says a lot along the lines of, of Ty Lee and Norm's comments about the, the difference and perhaps what led to, to the events of January 6th. And I agree with Tylee too that, that this really starts at least as far back as Reconstruction, as far back as 1865 and the lost cause of the Confederacy, the pushback against Reconstruction called uh, redemption. I, I, I grew up in, in an all white neighborhood in, in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, uh, New York City is not known as a bastion of conservatism, uh, but in my history classes, I learned American history, Civil War, well, the North uh, was fighting to end slavery, we were told, and the South was fighting for states' rights. 
uh, what the, that right was, the right to do what, we never got into. And then the North one, uh, reconstruction, a bunch of carpetbaggers, we were told, from the North came down and, and, and they were corrupt, so the South got rid of them. And that was the last we heard about black people in America until the 1950s. And then some black people were upset that they weren't being served at, at the same lunch counters as, as white people, and they were made to ride in the back of the bus. So then Martin Luther King Jr. made some nice speeches and everything was solved. We didn't learn anything about lynchings. Um, we didn't learn anything about the events that Ty Lee mentioned. Um, I had on my wall last year uh, the Equal Justice Initiative uh, calendar for the year. That's, that's Brian Stevenson's organization. And you can turn to any month, but I, I flipped open to September. And it has events on it. September 14th, 1874, white supremacist militia attacks New Orleans and overthrows, overthrows Louisiana's elected integrated state government. September 30th, 1919, the more recent, white people massacre nearly 200 black people in Elaine, Arkansas, after black sharecroppers demand fair prices. And you could go on and on. Um, when finally I started reading and learning these things, I felt like I'd been lied to my whole life. Uh, the, the events of January 6th have their origin in, in lies and untruths. And also uh, the sense of, of white people, I think, that uh, they, we, are losing their frankly, undeserved privileged position in society. Um, President Johnson once said, if you can convince the lowest white man he's better than the best black man, he won't notice you're picking his pocket. Hell, give him somebody to look down on and he'll empty his pocket for you. Well, a lot of white people who showed up on January 6th feel like America is turning against them and they're losing their privileged position in society. Uh, they feel they're entitled to their advantages and they feel a sense of grievance that that uh, position may not last. And this is a feeling among people who are economically disadvantaged, but also people who are uh, well off economically. A lot of the protesters or rioters, insurrectionists on January 6th were actually quite well off. There's a real estate agent who flew down there on her private jet but they feel that that privilege, that position may not last. And here they had a president who played to that, who mourned with them their lost way of life and promised to protect it. And President Trump in, in many ways uh, is responsible for what happened on January 6th. And, and he stoked this feeling of white resentment and loss of white privilege. Um, a lot of us like to think of ourselves as Americans as being you know, disrespectful of authority, nonconformist, individualist. But the fact is that, that a lot of us fear the hard work of democracy, of self-government, and we want a strong man to tell us it's all going to be all right and to solve all our problems for us. The protesters themselves are the best witnesses and perhaps the strongest witnesses against Donald Trump. As to the truth of that, they say they went there because Trump told them to go there and to take back their government. Uh, we see over the past year uh, that people will listen to a strong man leader, even if it costs them their lives. People have died because they won't wear masks. We've heard stories, all of us have seen these stories of, of people on their deathbed dying in a hospital of COVID, denying that it's anything more than the flu because President Trump said it's nothing more than the flu. The police uh, um, on January 6th, there were many police officers who were heroes on that day. They were understaffed and they were faced with a mob of thousands 
uh, we've seen videos of some of them confronting that mob and talking them out what they did or, or directing them in the wrong direction. Some police officers, turns out, may have been complicit. Um, but it is no, it, it, it's a fact that over the past year, the police treat stop the steel protesters, who are mostly white, quite different from Black Lives Matter protesters. An organization called the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project studied protests in the United States over the past year through November, so it didn't include the most recent one. And they found that the police are twice as likely to engage with and try to black and break up Black Lives Matter protesters than stop the steel protesters. And that when the police did engage with protesters, 34% of the time they used violence against the stop the steal protesters. But 51% of the time, they used violence against Black Lives Matter protesters. And finally, we, we saw on January 6th from the comments of the protesters themselves that the protesters' perception of where white police officers' allegiances lie have consequences. The, those protesters thought the police would be supportive, so it does seem like they thought they could get away with a lot more on that day. And we see how bold so many of them were and how many of them appealed to the police officers to join them in their attempted insurrection. Our, our second question, what are the repercussions for the Biden presidency protests and policing? There, there is reason to be somewhat optimistic. I, I, I argue that, that a lot of this stems from the leadership. Well, that leader is going to be gone. And we hope that, that he and some of the people around him will be prosecuted and punished for what they did. Uh, that may uh, uh, weaken these forces of insurrection. Private uh, internet providers and websites have shut down access to a lot of these people. They, they refuse to give a platform for hate speech. These are private entities. Uh, they are not obligated under the First Amendment to let these people use their, their facilities as a platform for hate. So, so that all may help. Uh, however, there are other things that aren't so promising. Uh, I have read recently that eight of the 10 biggest gun buying weeks since 1990 have occurred in this country since March. And that's not just among uh, right wingers, it's also among people like me who feel threatened by those people. So, so given our precious Second Amendment, Second Amendment right, we're all arming ourselves. Um, another consequence is, is Unfortunately, there have been attempts and continuing attempts by Republicans and conservatives to restrict voting rights so that um, in the future, the people who voted them out won't be able to vote. There, there's legislation pending in the Pennsylvania legislature to try to restrict mail-in voting. And as we all know, there have been 60 lawsuits over uh, voting, many of them raising frivolous and immaterial allegations, such as in Pennsylvania uh, and the, the, the uh, Brewster versus Ziccarelli litigation, uh, there was an objection raised that, that mail-in ballots received on election day should be rejected because they weren't dated, even though they were received before the deadline. Um, and the Pennsylvania Supreme Court threw that out. There's also a real risk, and we should be aware of this. A lot of us want to see these protesters uh, punished and, and this prevented, but there is a, a risk that this event will be used uh, um, by people to militarize the police even further, to fight this sort of thing. Also, legislation has been proposed in some states that actually is more aimed at, at, at protesters like the Black Lives Matter movement. For instance, the Florida state legislature on January 7th introduced uh, legislation called the Combating Violence, Disorder, and Looting and Law Enforcement Protection Act, which makes it a felony to engage in a, an assembly that causes damage to persons or property. 
Uh, it also makes it a defense for driving through a crowd if the driver was fleeing his or her safety. It makes it a crime to destroy or topple monuments. It prohibits harassment in public accommodations, what I call the Sarah Huckabee Sanders Protection Act. Uh, it, it creates mandatory minimum jail sentences for striking a law enforcement officer, including something thrown, a six month mandatory sentence. As part of the bill, it also prohibits defund the police movements. It prohibits state grants or aid to any local government that slashes the budget for law enforcement services. And it prohibits bail to someone uh, prosecuted under the statute. Florida introduced that and Mississippi also joined with nearly an identical bill. So we have to be aware that this, there could be a backlash that, that would uh, most likely end up not affecting the protesters we saw on January 7th, but the peaceful protesters they saw in Kenosha on January 6th under the, after the announcement about Jacob Blake. Uh, what can we do to, to eliminate the dangers of domestic terrorism, strengthen democracy? Well, well uh, there will be a law enforcement crackdown on domestic terrorism during the Trump years the Department of Justice and the FBI really were hamstrung in, in investigating and prosecuting domestic terrorism. Uh, that will change. Um, things could get worse, though, in terms of violence, a, a, as really deep white supremacists, the, the, the uh, Timothy McVeigh type, feel threatened. Um, a lot of people are arming themselves. Uh, some people say that's something we all ought to do, arm ourselves to protect the people we love and the principles we believe in, but it creates a rather scary picture. However, even in light of that uh, fear and, and that violence, I, I just, we can't surrender our commitment to, to factual truth, to historical truth, and especially our commitment to equality, racial justice, and human rights. We need more, not less democracy. We need more voting. We need easier voting. We need automatic registration, same day registration. I think we need to make the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico states. Uh, some states have signed what's called the Electoral College Compact, where their electoral votes will be guaranteed to go to the presidential candidate who wins a majority of the popular vote. We need all these those things, but we need uh, what a lot of us ha have uh, mentioned. We need discussion and we need dialogue, not only among people uh, of different economic status and race, but also people of different views. Um, yeah, I, I'm in the think tank. I'm in a writing group with some of the think tank members and fellows who spent a lot of time in prison but also with members of the, the 92nd Street Y from the east side of Manhattan, mostly uh, older people, people in their 70s and 80s, or from very, very affluent neighborhoods. Um, and yet we all come together and discuss things. And, and one of our members, uh, Big Lou, uh, Norm, Tylee known well, uh, Lou did 37 years for bank robberies. Uh, and the man's just a pleasure to be around. And one, one day he said, you know, th this is wonderful. We've all come together regardless of what's going on in the planet. This is a blessing and a calling both at the same time. Well, we need uh, those kinds of discussions. I, I, one you know, last comment about where I grew up and my hope for the future. I grew up in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. And one of the events on the Equal Justice Initiative calendar is August 23rd, 1989. A white mob in my neighborhood in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, murdered the black teenager Yusuf Hawkins for visiting a white girl in the neighborhood. That's actually inaccurate. He was there to buy a, a used car he saw advertised. The white mob thought he was there to visit a, a white teenage girl. Um, so there was that in my neighborhood and it still exists, but, but reading about my, in my heritage uh, recently, uh, I, I learned that the patron saint of Agrigento in Sicily is San Calagero. 
who was a black doctor from Ethiopia who came to Sicily in the fifth century and provided medical care to the Sicilians. And every July there's a parade in his honor. Well, here's to the feast of San Calagero. Let's have more of that in the future. Thank you, Tom. Lauren. Well, hello, everyone, and um, thank you for being with us. I want to thank all of my co-panelists. Um, I'm going to take us in a slightly different direction, but first I wanted to say that I see teachers, family members of mine, and friends from other parts of the United States. So broad is the need for this conversation that we're drawing people from all over the country. Um, and people have started on an autobiographical note, so I'll share that I'm from McKeesport, outside of Pittsburgh, and surely being from McKeesport shaped my interest in justice and in equity. It's probably also why I don't shy away from hard work, and what we're doing right now is definitely some hard work. Speaking of an interest in justice, Holocaust education does not belong to a political party. And neither do anti-Semitism, racism, bigotry, xenophobia, misogyny, et cetera, add to the list. Um, also, intergenerational trauma has occurred in diverse communities. And I'd like to say that we are all connected um, much more than we are divided. So as head of the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, we're participating in this program in, in that spirit, um, in the spirit of um, coming together we are a nonpartisan organization, especially now with policing under the microscope and the Holocaust Center's participation in the Inside Out program. We knew that this, this discussion right now would include balanced perspectives about what's happening right now. And we're hearing political leaders mentioned by name. That's the time that we're in right now. Normally at the Holocaust Center, we would be reluctant to engage this kind of conversation. Uh, we don't wanna put off anyone who's part of our organization because the Holocaust and caring about Holocaust organization does not belong to a political party. So for anyone who's attending who's uncomfortable that the Holocaust Center has, is in this role, these are the things that we need to face and talk about right now as a country. During the siege on the Capitol in Washington DC on January 6th, rioters marched through the rotunda with the Confederate flag. Um, one man who has become really the image of the siege on the Capitol was wearing a shirt that read Camp Auschwitz on the front and staff on the back. In 2020, a claims conference survey cautioned that people do not know what Auschwitz was. One of many concentration camps and a much smaller number of Nazi killing centers, Auschwitz was both um, in Nazi occupied Poland. Auschwitz has become synonymous with the Holocaust. At Auschwitz, Nazis carried out the systematic murder of nearly one million of the six million Jews killed in the Holocaust. Yet in 2020, 41% of all adults surveyed by the Claims Conference and 66% of all millennials surveyed did not recognize the word. We often make a case for the relevance of Holocaust knowledge in 2021. At one point, and not that long ago, you might have heard Holocaust educators talking about the lessons of the Holocaust, a fuzzy notion that there was a lesson inherent in the destruction of two thirds of the Jewish population of Europe, followed by what had until recently been the largest humanitarian crisis in history. I've worked in this field for more than half of my life and the field has changed. Where once we emphasized the Jewish experience, now we try to use the example of the Nazis and their allies and bystanders to understand perpetrator behavior. What accounts for man's inhumanity toward man? How do we understand a call to violence like what we saw less than two weeks ago at our nation's capital? How do we understand the power of propaganda, denial, and complicity? In the summer of 2017, I met Norm Conti at a town hall meeting in Hazelwood. 
Norm approached me to ask if the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh could offer a police training like the US Holocaust Memorial Museum offers in Washington, DC as part of the Inside Out program. That would be our role. I said yes. And so began a process of learning and teaching for me personally, a lot of learning for me personally. Police training at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum includes a history lesson and a guided tour of the permanent exhibition with its thousands of artifacts. For the training in Pittsburgh, we rely on testimony from a Holocaust survivor or a relative of a Holocaust survivor. So what is the history lesson? Well, it consists of two parts. First is the history of anti-Semitism, a hate movement with a history as old as the beginning of Christianity. It was not exactly the same 2000 years ago, but certain elements have been carried over across millennia. Jews are to blame for the world's problems, whether the problem be the bubonic plague or financial hardship brought on by COVID. QAnon followers believe in a global Jewish conspiracy that was published as the Protocols of the Elders of Zion in Russia more than 100 years ago, mass produced and distributed across the United States by Henry Ford, and widely distributed throughout the Middle East to this day. So we talk about the history of anti-Semitism and how anti-Semitism has persisted into 2021. Camp Auschwitz, okay. The second history lesson is the role of police in Nazi Germany and during the years of the genocide of European Jews and Roma, um, whom you may know of as gypsies. Police were complicit in the Holocaust. And in fact, in stages of the Holocaust, police were the killers, were the perpetrators. Uh, much as a memorial museum to the Holocaust opened in Washington, D.C. decades before a museum about African-American history and culture, the lesson about policing in the Holocaust is an instructive lesson that does not hit too close to home. Uh, Norm mentioned the concern that recruits would feel that they were being called racist, right? So if we start with the Holocaust and that example of policing, then we open up a larger conversation without making people feel really defensive at the outset. So about anti-Semitism and the threat that it now presents. The present day threat of anti-Semitism was made painfully clear to all of us on October 27th, 2018, when the Tree of Life building in the heart of Pittsburgh's Jewish neighborhood, Squirrel Hill, was attacked by a violent white supremacist. In the wake of that event, our police training changed yet again to include an expert from the FBI to make a case for taking complaints of anti-Semitic speech and threats seriously. Often they would be just disregarded prior to that and probably still. Three congregations met at the Tree of Life building in October of 2018. Tree of Life Orla Simcha, New Light, and Dor Hadash. Each congregation lost members on that day. The perpetrator was active on the social network Gab. Fueled by anti-Semitism and xenophobia, he had clearly broadcast his intentions to attack the Jewish community. His paranoid, paranoid worldview was built and nurtured by online campaigns of disinformation and propaganda. We can draw direct lines from the attack on the Tree of Life to the attack on the mosque in Christchurch, New Zealand, to the attack on the synagogue in Poway, California, to the attack on the Capitol on January 6, 2021. We can know with 100% certainty that anyone wearing a Camp Auschwitz shirt on January 6th was broadcast a specific worldview where Jews are less than human and are marked for elimination. I've talked about the danger of social media, the difficulty of reporting hate speech and threatening references to the Holocaust on social media. That happens because the people who are checking the language don't understand. Maybe they don't know what Auschwitz was. Maybe they don't know what Zyklon B was. That is an actual account I saw on Instagram, reported it, reported it, reported it, and I could not have it taken down. To combat violent hate in 2021, we must recognize references to the Holocaust and the credible threat they imply to individual lives and to American democracy. I follow Eric Ward, 
Um, he runs the Western State Center out of Portland, which is really a place that has seen a lot of white nationalism. He describes white nationalism and anti-Semitism in white nationalism. And according to Eric Ward, anti-Semitism is the core of white nationalism. And this is where I repeat my comment that racism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, et cetera, all of these forms of hate are linked inextricably. The Confederate flag, so flagrantly on display at the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, and again on January 6th at the Capitol, sounds the clarion call to white supremacy and racist hatred, but let me elaborate. The Confederate flag, a celebration of the Confederacy, is no longer exclusively anti-Black. It is the banner of the kind of violent hatred and disdain that we saw in January 6th. It knows no borders. As Professor Peniel Joseph at the University of Texas said, the American South is the United States of America. People immediately began to compare what happened on January 6th with the Holocaust. And as we talked about before we began this program, even Arnold Schwarzenegger added his voice with a video um, comparing the attack on the Capitol to the November 1938 pogrom in Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia, known as Kristallnacht. There is a parallel to be made, but it's not the one that he makes. So if you'll bear with me, um, Ty Lee spoke about the failure of reconstruction, failure to truly address what had happened in the United States. It was different in Germany and Austria after the end of World War II when the process of denazification happened, mainly driven by the United States, a well-coordinated process where um, former Nazis were made to understand what they had done, were made to account for the wrongs they had committed. But there is a parallel uh, in addition that can be made, and it's a really important one. Um, both the Holocaust and the attack on the Capitol were the culmination of a multi-year campaign of propaganda, denial, and complicity. Okay. This is a parallel that you can draw. So briefly getting to the questions that we're all addressing, um, I'm gonna talk about social factors that I see here. Um, I am not an expert on politics or economics, I'll talk about what I know better. In the winter of 2019, the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh began a rural outreach program. One thing that we haven't really talked about between our panelists is the presence of white nationalist, white supremacist groups all around Western Pennsylvania. And we recognize that right after the Tree of Life, we began this project. We wanted to reach middle and high school students in Western Pennsylvania who are vulnerable to recruitment into hate groups. That program really for its success relies on in-person outreach and our progress has been hindered by COVID restrictions. As we closed the doors to the Holocaust Center back in March and began to work remotely, I shuddered to think of the opportunity isolation presented for hate groups. With our lives in school moving online and with hate groups already advanced in the use of social media, the use of social networks, they were always better at this than we were. Um, it really created a perfect storm. And that's what I see as um, what led to, you know, this massive group of people showing up at the Capitol on January 6th. So what are the repercussions? we really have not begun to feel the repercussions. When I was invited to sit on this panel, I cautioned that my background is in history. I'm trained as a historian and we like to see the evidence. We wait for the documents. And um, as I'm watching you know, footage that has come out since the sixth, the live footage was disturbing, but what we've seen since then is truly alarming. Um, repercussions um, will be felt We'll see them at inauguration and even before that as the National Guardsmen are deployed and now we have to do background checks to make sure that there aren't going to be people there who in fact want to harm President-elect Biden. So what steps can ordinary citizens take? I'm going to suggest something really outlandish. We need to educate ourselves and also we need to get out of our echo chambers. So I'm not the first person to say that now. 
we need to make an effort to talk to people who don't agree with us. I was part of this really wonderful conference for the last few days. And one of the speakers was a woman named Shannon Foley Martinez. She was formerly part of a violent white supremacy movement and she was able to pull herself out of it when she was approached without judgment. But that was some years ago and I fear that it's even harder to do that now. Um, upon releasing a statement about the attack on the Capitol, that was our Holocaust Center statement, uh, much of that statement formed the skeleton of what I've said today. I received several angry emails from people who claimed my statement accused them of being anti-Semitic when I had said no such thing. My takeaway is that too many people right now would argue with the assertion that the sky is blue. We really have our work cut out for us. So I'm going to leave it there. I already see some very good questions coming in um, in the Q&A. And uh, one more thing, we've been asked to share an article and I do want to share it because I don't feel that it's my role to be the censor of the people who are on the panel. I'll caution uh, that as the Holocaust Center, we're always nonpartisan. Um, this article specifically takes on, it's a psychological article and it talks about President Donald Trump. So that's the caveat from the perspective of the Holocaust Center. Uh, we're part of this very important discussion. We're not going to be a censor, but um, I'll, I'll leave it there. And thank you everyone who's joining us. And thank you to my panelists. Well, thank you very much, um, Lauren. Uh, we're going to uh, open things up for the panelists to talk with one another and to exchange their ideas and views with one another before we get to the Q&A. But I just want to alert you to um, a, a psychological perspective on, on uh, some of the events, some of the processes that led to the events on the Capitol, uh, which will be posted in, uh, in the chat. Uh, section. It's uh, an article about uh, a psychiatrist by the name of Bandy X. Lee, who's been a, a very forceful and, and, and vocal uh, uh, articulate critic of President Trump, and who's been warning for a long, long time uh, about the dangers that uh, the Trump presidency pr presents to uh, the future of democracy in the United States. Um, that will appear in the chat section, I'm sure, uh, in due course, if it hasn't already. Um, I just want to make some general comments and then open things up to the panelists to, to talk with one another. Um, one of the things that's striking about uh, your presentations is that it, it points to a deep, deep failure of our public education system. I think, I think things that Lauren said, that Thomas said, Ty Lee, all point to a, a, a tremendous failure of, of public education and a need to reinvigorate uh, and, and, and perhaps radically rethink public education in this country. And I'm not talking about universities. Uh, I think that's too late. Uh, I think we have to start in, in, in primary and secondary schools. Um, anyway, I'll leave that comment there for now. I, I, I think many of you would agree with that. Um, another thing that uh, struck me is that uh, uh, Lauren, uh, in particular, stressed the role that social media has played in promoting the hatred and lies that provoked the riots and led up to the riot on, uh, on the Capitol. What, my, my question to all of you is, why did it take so long for social media companies to deplatform uh, hate, spe uh, hate speech? Um, uh, why did it take so long to deplatform President Trump, who's been uh, uh, disseminating lies through social media uh, uh, for for most of his most of his presidency, all of his presidency? Another comment: um, both Ty Lee and Thomas referenced the fact that the the horrors that we're witnessing and and trying to address now. Uh, go back to understand that we need to go back to reconstruction. I agree. I, I, I thoroughly agree. And, and the best way to do that, I think, is, is through public education. But that said, I wonder how many of you remember uh, Newt Gingrich, the speaker, Republican Speaker of the House during the uh, Clinton administration, who induced Republicans to believe that it was possible for them to have a permanent Republican majority in the House and the Senate and to hold the White House. 
that that's what they were moving towards was a permanent public, a Republican majority. Um, I, I wondered, has this idea sort of uh, permeated uh, the, the, the certain sections of the, of the Republican party? And uh, has it led to the belief, did it, did it foster or encourage or reinforce the belief that the, the election had to be stolen because they're entitled to be <laughs> a permanent majority? I mean, uh, I think this. I, I think some of the seeds of these ideas go back uh, to to uh, uh, the Gingrich era. Um, finally, uh, I'd like to ask all of you to reflect and, and answer at your leisure uh, how we can address the infiltration of law enforcement and the armed forces by white supremacists. Um, uh, Tom, in particular, uh, pointed to the complicity of uh, the possible, and in some cases, I think, documented complicity of police. Um, police both suffered um, uh, tremendously uh, in, in the riot on the Capitol, but then there were many off-duty policemen and servicemen who were also among the crowd who were attacking the police defending the Capitol. So th this is a, a situation which, um, uh, it, it, what we're hearing in the in the media, in the Washington Post, in in the New York Times, is that uh, white supremacists have infiltrated law enforcement and and the armed forces to a degree that we we haven't been aware of and we haven't been paying attention. Well, now we're now they have our attention. What are we going to do about it? So, take it away, panel. Who'd like to Who'd like to speak first? I'm gonna say something really quickly, just just short. And it's it's funny how me and my dad was talking, and um, as we would see certain things that were happening, and he would be like, "Why won't they arrest them? You know, why won't they do X, Y, Z when it comes to law enforcement?" And it would be uh, certain things that he would see, and I kept saying, "Because they are them, like they are who they are them, and within itself, like you you we didn't we didn't get to a point." that you've seen this 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 major uh and i'm and this i'm gonna be kind of you know comical in a sense with this you've never got to the point that you've seen a bunch of a uh, uh, white robes kkk robes at the thrift store like that they've they've given up their robes like the clan has given up their robes like they got to the point of no longer having to come out with robes and, and burn crosses but they infiltrated systems that they can hurt us even more so they become law enforcement officers. They became correctional officers. They became judges. They became like these things. There, there's been times when, when I've been within a system and a justice system and a judge have told a, a, a person to, to look out on the ledge and how many pigeons did he see? And that would start the number he would start on what he was about to prosecute, you know, what time he was about to give him, you know, as far as the judge. And I'm saying to myself, that type of evil, like, you had to actually put yourself in that position to bring that type of evil into this justice system. And it's not by, it's not by chance that you got to the point. So when they put their robes away, um, it, to me, it was a, it was a systematic, um, a, a strategic plan to say, we must fill these positions if we want to continue to be the, the, the clan and, and have this damage to them that we, that we need. So to, to us, you know, when I say to us, We've always known that they've been the officers, you know, that they've been the judges. They so it was no surprise that when I seen footage of police officers letting people in to attack the Capitol, because to us, they've always been there. They've always been there. And I'm gonna just say that shortly. I don't want to get into a rant. Right. Well, uh, Tylee, thank you for that. Um, but I guess the question is now now that more people are aware of this fact. What are we going to do about it as a, as a society? Um, Norm, do you want to say something? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to because th this, our, it's only our awareness, right, that's new, right? It, of course, right, the police were established in the early industrializing cities to control ethnic minorities who could get in the way of business, right? 
they were they were Irish and Italian, but they weren't considered white. So it's of course there's policing, the military, dentistry, right, has always had plenty of uh, whites. This is a nation founded in white supremacy, and I understand it. it it makes it more like uh, maybe maybe it's our conspiracy for for the left to think, but this, it's it's not the lefty uh, pedophiles or elected whatever. It's the the white supremacists in these organizations, and I'm sure they're there, and it does need to be dealt with. At the same time, th there's it's a little more complicated and more simple at the same time because until we all address the white supremacy in us in this country, then th there's no real hope. And maybe those folks will be damaged, be doing damage. But it's kind of when you think when you, this is a super lefty panel uh, of because I know you because you're my friends. Uh, but we love to look down on poor whites. But a friend of mine is the son of a uh, early black doctor uh, in the, locally who had a, a office in the black neighborhood and office in the white neighborhood and his son said to him, why, why do you go to the white neighborhood and treat these poor white people? Because, because you don't understand white people are worse to poor white people than they are to us. So if I go there and I just treat them normally and decently, they think I'm the greatest thing ever, right? So of course we have to find, if there are infiltrators, we, of course, at the same time, if we don't think about how this has infiltrated us or how this is the fundamental thing that we're doing anyway, then there's nothing to protect. Huh? Yeah, I, 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 the, it, the police are, are part of society. So, so, so there's racism throughout our society. Of course, there, there, there's going to be racism among, among the police too. And, and, and the story Ty Lee told well, well, it illustrates in part the, the difference between racism by a judge or, or, or a lawyer. It's in words, and it's conducted in a courtroom, and it's all very orderly, versus racism by a police officer who's doing it out on the streets and, and uses violence. The result in both cases is just as violent and, and perhaps even more harmful when the judge do, it does it. Um, you know, we, we've got to recognize that... that, that uh, there aren't many good union jobs for working class black or white people anymore, but the good jobs are being a police officer, being a corrections officer in all those prisons that have been built in all those rural counties. And Ty Lee talks often about, about how, how our prison system, our criminal justice system is set up to profit off black bodies. And, and often the, the people in those rural counties who are, who are getting the good jobs are, are white because those counties are white. So, so almost right away, it sets up a black versus white opposition. And, and you know, our, 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 our neighborhoods are segregated, our schools are segregated, our, 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 uh, they've been redlined for, for a century. Um, We've all said it, and perhaps it's simplistic, we need more talk, more discussion, more efforts to, to, to not only reach across color lines, but class lines, but also political views and to try to, uh, to talk to people. And for example, the, 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 the police officer who was killed in, in the Capitol riots was a Trump supporter. But, but he, he was in favor of gun control. So not all Trump supporters are monolithic. And he gave his life to protect people like Nancy Pelosi and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Um, you know, it, 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 it's difficult. I, I'm guilty of it myself. It's kind of funny. I've, I've taken the, the implicit bias test and... Uh, I find that my strongest uh, implicit bias is against young blonde women. I mean, women who look like Fox News commentators or White House press secretaries. <laughs> well, it's still a bias. <laughs> it's still a prejudice. And I need to confront it and try to reach and discuss.
Lauren. Um, I, I want to answer with a question. Just as we get into this conversation, I'm wondering, because all of you are involved with the Elsinore Bennu think tank and with the Inside Out program, how these dynamics play out between, you know, when you go to prison, and I, I've been to, um, to the prison with you several times, um, how do these dynamics play out when you bring police recruits to SCI Fayette, for example? This is where I live. There, there's a, a dynamic tension, right? between people who see themselves as on two different sides, right? But they're so, they're so much the same. Uh, you walk in there with those two groups and it's scary, right? But then you get people talking about whatever you get them talking about and they're interested in each other. It's like Ty Lee is uh, the same age as I am. He grew up on the North side. I grew up in a, small town called Newcastle, an hour south of the city. Uh, we have very different life experiences, right? Uh, he talks about the story with his grandmother. Um, in, in one of the class, in one of the graduations we had, Tali was in a room with uh, an incarcerated man who was there for the killing of his brother, right? So, The, these things are profound, right? And I, for me, it's the only way we're going to get anywhere is to, you know, when, when, you, when you bring a police officer together with someone who has been harmed by the police, right? And they can talk honestly about that, right? When you bring me and Ty Lee, who, uh, and Ty Lee's my brother, there's no question about that. Uh, maybe, if, maybe my twin brother, I don't know. Uh, that's a compliment for him. Uh, so, but we, you know, we agree, we disagree, we fight. I try to get him to come over and help me move furniture on Sunday, but he won't come. Uh, so, so that's it. I mean, by the end of a class, the recruits are, are being rooted for by the men in prison, right? Hoping that they can go out and hoping it could be different. Someone, Someone asked if there was a reason, if we could give him a reason for hope, and that person was my cousin. So uh, I'm gonna add that. The, the reason for hope is the fact that we're here, that we're trying. Uh, the, only, the only reason not for hope is what you, what you said, Lauren, when, when you said the thing about, oh my God, we're all isolated and it's all on social media, and just like they're better at guns and social media than we are. So not that that's a reason for hope, that's the opposite. But the fact that we keep trying, the fact that I didn't even want to come here tonight. Uh, I haven't slept well since the insurrection, uh, dealing with the, the other stuff I talked about at the top of this call. This, this, these are difficult times, but we keep pushing and we're gonna keep pushing. There'll be a lot more, expect more from all of us and we'll expect more from you. And, and maybe that's the reason for hope. I'm curious, do any of uh, you other panelists have feel that there's substantial reasons for hope going forward? Lauren. I have to believe that. I mean, we're, we're very active in education. And if you spend any time with eighth graders, you're gonna start to feel hopeful. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I don't wanna put too much on kids to figure out our problems, but they really are incredible. And the more that you're making connections with people, this gets back to how isolated we are. Uh, we do have technology that allows us to connect to people. In this conference that I attended, there were people from 30 different countries all over the world. That can happen now in this strange virtual environment. That's a reason for hope to me. We are connected. We, we can work together. We can be better. And it's what, it's what I really like about being involved in the Inside Out program and in going to teach at SCI Fayette. That was profound for me. Uh, those of you who were there with me know um, there, there is reason for hope because we all know we can be better. And I think that we yearn for that. Um, for those of us who participate, I'm, sorry, go ahead. No, I, 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 despite my comments, I'm optimistic too. I think there, there, there's reason for hope. Um, 
uh, the election is one reason, and not, not just because of the result, but it's rather extraordinary in America for an incumbent president who had a wonderful economy to lose. That's because people organized and turned out to vote, even under the, the, the lockdown conditions. The election in Georgia, the senatorial election, that's really an extraordinary result in that state. And, and, and that's the result of, of people like Stacey Abrams and the people waiting online coming out and voting under difficult circumstances. I can tell you my professional community, e even talking to the people lo like me who, who, who have power, who are affluent, who are white, uh, there's a sense we have to do better and, and, and we have to hire uh, w w with an aim of increasing diversity. And we have to address the inequality in our criminal justice system and, and try a different way. Uh, um, even during the, the last four years, there's been a move uh, to, to in some way address mass incarceration, like everything that's been done the last four years is sort of uh, uh, done incompetently, but, but there's still an urge to do that, for, including groups as, as different as uh, George Soros and the Koch Foundation. Um, so, so, so uh, th there is a desire to, to do better. Um, it, it's scary times for all of us. Uh, and, and some people are going to reach for their guns and, and do dangerous things. But I think a lot of us are doing what we're doing here today and reaching across. Thank you, Tom. Um, another question that showed up in the uh, Q&A uh, that uh, I'd, I'd like you all to address if you, if you choose. Um, has to do with um, communicating across political divides. I mean, the the uh, the Inside Out program that Norm Norm described uh, and and which all of us are, have been involved with at one point or another, um, in in many ways could be a model for the kinds of processes that need to take place on a macro level, a macro social level. Uh, to get people with disparate perspectives and 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 disparate interests talking together, recognizing their their common humanity, and uh, but how do we do this on a on a like how the, the, there's the immediate difficulty of how do we talk to our neighbors you know who are who don't share our political views, but then there's the question of how do we kindle a a nationwide conversation where we can actually have these conversations? Any thoughts? That's that's an addition to the homework assignment I gave earlier, Dan. You you've uh, oh <laughs> you're, you're you know you're known for challenging the students. So uh, get to work, kids. Huh. I, I would I'd, I'd, seriously I'd add to that because Lori Pompa, who created the uh, Inside Out programs on this call, she was an adjunct faculty at Temple, you know, teaching a course of criminal justice, and took a, took kids on a tour of a of a prison and talked to one of the men serving life there. They had a, a long discussion and he said, wouldn't it be great if you made a whole semester in this prison? And so that's a, a man serving a life sentence and that's this woman who's an adjunct faculty member. And now this is a program that's all over the world, right? Thousands of people are moving through this program. So when I, when I got introduced to this program, um, it was, that was probably the most exciting part of it that two people who just came up with something and, and look what happened. And since then I've been doing it, working that system, moving it in my own directions, you know, obviously with police or whatever, whatever, uh, a think tank on the outside or reentry programs. Right. So these things snowball. So I don't know that we have a specific, or we're going to come up with a specific thing, but, there, there's potential in so many of the people watching this Zoom or wherever they are that they need to create their own thing. And if you use that, that tension between the two different groups as a fuel to drive your machine, who knows what you accomplish. I would say that the key is finding common ground with uh with your neighbor um i know that's that's one thing uh 
you know, my son, he, you know, he has to play baseball and, you know, baseball locally and, you know, is, is a, is a very white sport. And, um, a lot of times he tells me, he says, um, I know this thing that just happened, uh, on, on, on up at, up at the Capitol building. He said, that's going to be weird when the, when the guys on the team starts talking about it. Cause you know, a lot of the kids would, you know, talk with some of the rhetoric that their parents would talk leading up to the election and all of that Trump stuff. And, and he's, so even when this thing happened at the Capitol building, you know, my son's 15 and it was just with his travel baseball program, which is, you know, 90% white families and, you know, you know, pretty decent, you know, making really good money because you had to pay two, three grand just to play in, the, in these leagues. Um, and he was just concerned with the conversation the kids would have about the event. Um, and, 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 and to me, uh, the one thing though, is that as long as when we're in that baseball arena and he, and we're doing well and he's doing well, they don't look at him as a black kid. They look at him as a, as a Beaver Valley baseball player, you know, and sports has been the one thing, even in this region, you know, when the Steelers are doing well, you know, it's, they don't see black and white, they see black and gold. So we, we gotta, it's, you gotta find that common goal and that commonality that we have with, 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 with the, with these folks is baseball and that'll give them the ability to kind of have discussion with me and with having discussion, give them the ability to kind of, you know, lower the, lower the, the, the wall and, and really try to see, you know, what it is that, that we all should be pushing for because, um, um, to kind of revert back to one of the questions that you had, I think social media kind of got involved because they realized the direction we were heading in is bad for business. I mean, when, when you let folks overthrow the government, it's bad, it becomes bad for business. And at the end of the day, you're messing with the dollar. Um, so it's like, and, and they even had, I think, 70 CEOs uh, signed on and said Trump needed to make sure this is a peaceful trans, transition of power because it's bad for business. At the end of the day, there cannot, we cannot be headed towards uh, you know, um, civil war. It's bad for business at the end of the day. So finding that common goal um, and then having honest discussions and, and, open, and being open-minded, being open-minded, to be honest. All right, uh, we've moved into the Q&A part. Uh, uh, another question that appeared uh, just recently in the Q&A is, are there efforts uh, in the Pittsburgh area uh, to include anti-racist curriculum in uh, uh, the teaching done in our primary and secondary schools? Are we aware of any, Lauren? I'm, I'm, well, Lauren, okay, yes, you. But apart from your, the work that you do. Or, yes, no, this is, this is, I understand it not as a question about Holocaust in schools, but about truly anti-racist curriculum in schools. And it's not the same thing. There's another question that hints at that, that I might just include, if you don't mind, about sure. the Holocaust. Of US, policing in the United States has a different history from policing in the Holocaust and goes back longer in the history of the United States. So I'll start there. Uh, because we're talking about two histories that aren't adequately taught. One I'm very actively teaching about and get, making sure it gets into schools is Holocaust education. I think when we think about anti-racist curriculum, it means a couple of things to me. One problem that we have in schools is that there's not enough, there's not enough about the African-American experience, period, whether or not you're teaching an anti-racist curriculum. We had a great exhibit um, if we say so ourselves at the Holocaust Center called Optic Voices Roots. And we did that with Ime Alaquiva. And when he introduced tours, he always said he didn't learn about the Holocaust. He didn't learn his own history. He didn't learn about slavery. He didn't learn about the end of slavery. Um, so really, when we think about what is in the school curriculum, it should be that. Um, it should be a more representative, inclusive kind of curriculum. Who writes the textbooks? You know, we need to look at all of these things. And so there are efforts underway and a lot more work to be done there. And just to get back really quickly to the one about being honest about history and, you know, there's a lot of controversy, at least in the circles where, where I'm active in Holocaust education, about when we make comparisons with the Holocaust that don't fit. And the reason that I don't like comparisons is I don't like them when they're lazy. I don't like them when we say, we're gonna talk about 
policing in the Holocaust, and then we will have learned about policing in the United States. That's lazy. Uh, we need to be committed to actually learning about the two things that we're comparing, if we want to make the comparison. Like, we need to know what we're talking about. So um, to that comment, yes, it's a different history in the United States. Talking about the Holocaust is a point of entry into having that honest and difficult conversation of, of what the real history is in this country. I think we gotta be honest. Um, um, like, so if, we, if, if you look at the work of the Daughters of the Confederate, outside of them um, building statues and, and creating the narrative that they wanted, they also controlled what information went into the textbooks about the Civil War. Like, so that's something that people have to re-examine, like, okay, we have these textbooks for years and it gets passed down and passed down, but they were, they were like, this was something directly that they made sure that they controlled the narrative in the textbooks on the Civil War, and these were daughters of the Confederate. Um, and then, so when I look at Pittsburgh Public School System, I, I wanna say like, if you look at the union in the Pittsburgh Public School System, teachers union, I wanna say is, I think it's majority white women. Um, that's a, that, that'd be a tough, that's a tough, let's say nut to crack in a sense, I don't mean to use these words, but to say that now they wanna have this, like we need to have discussions on teaching black history. Um, I think that's tough, something like penetrating these different unions um, on what the curriculum should be or what the curriculum looks like. I mean, right away it gets to a union issue and union you know, would end up protecting it. And I, I really don't, having these conversations to be able to get a 60% you know, teachers union to say, you know what, we need to teach more black history um, to black kids. Um, I think that we gotta have an honest conversation about that, you know, and, and folks gotta be honest. I think they have to say, look, we're not comfortable with doing that. You know, um, I was a part of uh, getting an African-American history class up at Perry and they brought in a white guy to teach it and, did, and all, all hell broke loose. It was like, oh, you gave us the class, but then you got this white guy teaching it. And he was like, well, what do y'all want me to teach? Like, how do y'all want me to? And he kind of let us run the class. So too many times it gets to within these union systems, it's like you can't, and even, even when Bill Gates and them came in and Melinda Gates and them came in with the uh, Gates Foundation money to try to improve the educational system in the Pittsburgh Public School, they only got but so far. And then the union stopped them, said, no, no, no. You know, we, we're not going to do that. And, and the union kind of, you know, made sure that they couldn't do what it was that they wanted to do to improve the educational system for the Pittsburgh Public Schools. So that's something else we have to address as well. Yeah, there's work to be done. And, and one problem there when you talk about the work that you did and then the teacher was a white man, it's, it's a problem in the pipeline of who's becoming teachers in the first place. Yeah. So there's, there's so much work to be done there, but, but we're doing it. I mean, sl slowly but slowly, we can make change there. Yes, ma'am. All right. Uh, there's another question in the Q&A that I'd like to uh, flag for your attention. Um, I'll, ju I'll just read it as is, and then I'll try maybe tr translate it a little bit. After the continued platforming of avowed white supremacists and conspiracy theorists by publications like the New York Times, where is the line between civil discourse and amplifying the voices of hateful ideologies? Is there a line? I don't know about the first part of that question. I don't know about the New York Times giving platforms to uh, uh, racist and white supremacists and conspiracy theorists. That, that may or may not be the case. But the second part of the question is, is very much to the point. Where is the line between civil discourse and, and, and hate speech? And, uh, and how, within the framework of... of the Constitution as it exists, can we address uh, hate speech um, uh, when it exists? Con uh, Tom, you're smiling ruefully? Uh, yes, I, I, I'm, I'm smiling be, be, because my current job is I'm the head of attorney discipline for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And I was sued recently uh, by a lawyer who objected to a new rule we have that prohibits discrimination. Uh, by, by lawyers on the grounds that the, our state Supreme Court, which uh, promulgated the rule, had violated his First Amendment right to engage in hate speech. He won in federal district court. We're appealing it, 
but but he uh, uh, and part of uh, 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 what the judge wrote is we were just trying to impose our personal moral preferences on the bar. Now I thought uh, anti discrimination and equal rights were part of our constitution, but but maybe I missed that in school too. Um, so. so uh, they, we have, uh, the elections have consequences. We have a, a U.S. Supreme Court that is very protective of what we all might consider hate speech, people showing up at the funerals of veterans to, to say they, it was right they died because they were gay. And the Supreme Court upheld the right of people to do that yeah. recently. Um, I, I mean, a simple legal answer is private newspapers, private websites can, can prohibit anything they want. Uh, um, and that's one way to deal with it. And as Ty Lee pointed out, they're businesses. And they're going to lose bu business I I if they allow hate speech on their platforms. Of course, they allowed it because it got them business. Yeah. Be, be, yeah. It's a, so the profit motive cuts both ways. Um, you know, aside from rewriting the First Amendment, um, yeah, I, I, I think the answer is that private companies have to do that, but, but we do have to speak out respectfully. I mean, there's a difference between public debate wh where we should be respectful, but, but we can be strong in what we say and talking to people one-on-one, -on -one, where perhaps we have to be a little more patient with some of the things that they see, they say, uh, to show that, that yes, we, we respect them as human beings and we want to, to reach common ground. It's not an easy question. It's very, very difficult. And like everything we're talking about, it's going to be an ongoing struggle. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm uh, scrolling through the uh, Q&A looking for um, another question. Uh, here's an interesting question, uh, which uh, I, I, we haven't even remotely addressed so far and may only be, and may be somewhat tangential to some of the things we've been talking about, but it's an interesting questions, question and I'd be interested in your responses. Would it be better not to punish Trump in order not to create new situations of unknown outcome? We've seen a fair, what, what appears to be a, a, a kind of an element of reluctance on the part of Joe Biden and, and to, to step in and, and, and take steps to uh, address um, Donald Trump's various crimes. He wants to leave it to the uh, uh, the, the Attorney General of New York and other uh, uh, institutions to to sort of you know bring about a day of reckoning for Trump for for the many of the things he's said and done. But w w should there be a, a more coordinated effort? I mean, and what and a related question which just popped into my head: What do you think? How, or, or do you think that the Senate will will approve uh, the motion to impeach? Um, because if it does, that in itself will produce uh, very serious consequences um, uh, for uh, for the outgoing president. What do you think about all that? I think we're at a time when some folks have to commit what's called political suicide and just do what's right, period. Like the law, I mean, this is a law and order president, so-called. Mm -hmm. um, and if folks um, broke the law, then Biden needs to step up and, and, and some politicians need to step up and they may be committing political suicide, but you can't, you, you, you cannot, to me, you, you know, as I, as I see a headline and say Trump has a, another hundred people that he's about to pardon and how folks say, you know, you told me to go up there and I, I expect a pardon. We just can't continue to see this uh, process of folks breaking laws um, and trying to overthrow the government and get to the point of saying, 
as long as y'all just calm down and no more violence, you know, we'll just we'll just transition to the next, you know, because they we've done that already. We've done that in 1876. I want to say that it was, um, and that's when they told them we'll just as long as we will let you guys do what you want with your Negroes. Um, we can't do that again. We like we gotta get up to the point that some politicians have to decide, Republicans, Democrat, that they're gonna do what's right, even if it, if it's considered political suicide, and they have to stand up and do what's right. And he needs to be charged, and everybody that committed a crime needs to be charged, and we need to re, you know re restore some law and some order. What about the rest of you? How do you feel about that? I mean, if, if the answer could could be a, a name, Susan Collins. <laughs> mm -hmm. Remember what she said about the, the impeachment, the first impeachment. Well, we don't need to do that because he's learned his lesson. Well, obviously that wasn't correct. I, I, well, look, Ty Lee and I uh, um, aren't people who are in favor of more prosecution, more incarceration, more convictions. But for certain, I mean, he, he, there's an educational uh, concern here that, okay. that no one's above the law and, and, and that wrongdoing of this magnitude needs to be addressed and punished in, in some way. Um, I, I, it's too early to say about Biden's approach, but, but he does have a pandemic to deal with. And this really isn't his call. It's up to the Senate. And now he wants to get things passed, but the Senate ought to be able to do more than one thing at a time. It's up to the Senate to, to try and convict or acquit uh, Trump so, so they can do it. And given the narrow uh, article of impeachment, it shouldn't be that difficult. There are uh, prosecutors around the country who, who uh, should just look at the evidence and the law and decide whether or not there's a prosecutable case against Donald Trump, against uh, uh, people around him. And, and I think the, it, personally, I think it's the right thing for Biden to take a hands-off approach both ways, neither to take the lock him up approach of, of, of his predecessor, but also not the can't we all get along approach. If there's a case, this isn't my job, you folks go ahead and do it and, and let the chips fall where they may. Since I'm not a lawyer like Tom or a politician like Tali, uh, I would pivot to the question, the acts of brutal collective violence, including the murder of a police officer at the Capitol insurrection was the perfect example of white on white crime thoughts. Uh, that's interesting to me because is Trump being is Trump being impeached for white on white crime? Uh, I would I would say this is a terrible example of white on white crime because white on white crime is the wealthy and middle class and whatever whites who ignore uh, the poor whites, right? So we actively seek out and harm the poor blacks, right? But we white privilege for the poor whites is that you're ignored right but that's a, that creates its own set of problems it's better right better be ignored than sought out and destroyed but uh to me that's that's the unpardonable offense lauren would you like to weigh in on this i'm gonna pass on that Okay. Are you trying to get her fired, Dan? Yeah, you, you all are. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I forget. Um, I, no, I no, I, I'm going to pass on that. But there are some really, if, if I may also go to the Q&A like Norm did, sure. there are still some questions about media and social media yeah. and Fox News and talk radio. And um, yeah, so I think we can kind of answer those at once and say that, um, this, we've, we've gotten into that a bit already, but there is this need to get ratings that has infected the way that news is written and reported. Um, and the more sensational, the more likely to get ratings. And I find it very hard to find reliable, reliable news sources, whatever that means, uh, because so many news sources have now hidden behind saying that they're editorial news and so they, they can report on opinions. And I think that news sources that represent different 
like all sides of the political spectrum are culpable in what is happening right now. So that, that's my answer there. It's not just Fox News, it's happening. This is one where you really can say on, on both sides, this is happening. And it's, it really has created, it has fostered the situation. We have another question about how do you safely talk to people who are on the complete opposite side from you politically. It has created that us versus them dynamic that is really endangering all of us. And so I, I don't have an easy answer for how do we engage a conversation with people who don't think what we think about what's happening now. That's why I gave the example of Shannon Foley Martinez when she talks about, you know, coming out of this violent white supremacist movement that she was so involved in was because someone was accepting of her. I don't know, I don't know that that happens now. I don't see much of that going on now. Um, and that also that plays into the response that I got to my very moderate statement about what happened at the Capitol where someone came out like you're accusing me of all these things like I know I didn't write that at all but it didn't matter because it's it's us or them it's it's black or it's white and it's not anything in between All right, um, Ty Lee, I just wanna draw your attention to a question that's addressed directly to you uh, from Kathy Ruboul. Uh, do you see it in, in the Q&A? It reads, how could I learn more about Mr. Thompson working in violence prevention? I've worked with youth who have a, who've committed homicides and it is an area I, I care a lot about. And how can I learn more about the program that Mr. Conti mentioned, Inside Out? In Massachusetts, we're looking into bringing police into the prison. So I would like to know the pitfalls and the guidelines to help it go well. So I, th th I guess this question really is addressed to, to, to Norm and Tylee and Tom. Um, you, you're, uh, you should type an answer in if you, if you have a minute just to respond to this question. I'll, I'll put my email in because that's gonna, gonna be more time than I have, but sure. Okay, thank you. I'll put mine in as well. So uh, back to you, panel. Are there any other questions in the Q and A that you you personally want to address? Because because there's there's several, and I don't know which which would be most apt. Huh. These are very good questions that are left, and we don't have much time, so it's no. it's hard it's hard to pick one. Um, I see one that is about. Um, I think that this is a whole other panel that I would love to do at some point mm -hmm. that gets into black Jewish relationships. This is so important and how we work together and, and what are concerns about um, anti-Semitism, anti-Israel forces in Black Lives Matter, such an important conversation. Yeah. Let's, let's put a bookmark in that to the person who asked that question. I, I'm not yeah. ignoring it. I want to do it. It just needs more time. Yeah. Okay. We, we will get around to it. Um, all right, I think we'll, it's, it's two minutes to six. We're supposed to adjourn in two minutes and we, that's not enough time to, to really a, give a substantive answer to any question. So I'd like to thank uh, all four of the panelists for their, uh, their remarks and their participation today. And I'd like to thank all of you who've attended and stayed with us to the end here. Um, um, thanks very much for uh, sharing this time with us. I hope that our conversations have been illuminating, and that they've uh, given you some grounds for hope or some sense of direction on, on how to proceed in these difficult and confusing times. Uh, so all the best uh, to all of you and uh, good night.